you go on the sound? All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight, not being uh, like those angry liberals on campus who wanted to boycott this event. It's good to see you guys all here. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Caleb Wayman. I'm the president of the College Republicans here at the University of Minnesota Morris. Before we get started here, I just want to hand out a few thank yous to some of the groups that made this event possible. First, a big thank you to Young America's Foundation for supporting us. Without Young America's Foundation, there would not be as much political discussion here on this campus. Also, thank you to the Morris Funding Committee, the Morris North Star, and the Campus Administration for their support in bringing in tonight's speaker. Now on to our speaker. Ben Shapiro is the editor-in-chief of DailyWire.com and host of The Ben Shapiro Show. He's a graduate of UCLA and Harvard Law School. Shapiro is the author of many books, including the New York Times bestseller, Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America, and his latest book, True Allegiance, both of which are available online through Amazon.com. So get yourself a copy. Glenn Beck calls Shapiro a warrior for conservatism against those who use fear and intimidation to stifle honest debate. Even the liberal Washington Post, in the aftermath of Shapiro's devastating destruction of Piers Morgan on national television, conceded that Shapiro is a foe of extraordinary polemical agility. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ben Shapiro. Well, thank you for braving the rain and the weather. This is why I don't live in Minnesota. <laughs> and thanks for having me. I really appreciate the University of Minnesota YAF for having me. Hopefully, unlike the last two nights at DePaul and University of Wisconsin, people can control themselves. I won't be threatened with arrest or shouted down, which actually was my last two nights. Uh, and, uh, you know, discussion. For, uh, the way that this is going to work is when we actually get to the Q&A, if you are somebody on the left, we want you to actually have a chance to converse. So we'll get, we'll get to you first when we get to the Q&A. Uh, you have priority. Um, but if you're too upset to ask questions, I understand that too. It's been a very upsetting two weeks for folks on the left now that Lightbringer Hillary has finally gone down and uh, Donald Trump is uh, up in the Tower of Orange Power as the president-elect <laughs> of the United States. And, uh, and for the, I, I don't know if they've been doing it at this campus. I know they've been doing it at a lot of campuses. Uh, a lot of the people who are on the left have been wearing these safety pins around to, to show all of their colleagues that they are not these racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe Trump supporters. Uh, and uh, I thought in, if there were leftists in the audience who needed them, I brought some extras. I brought some extra safety pins for you. Uh, and I also brought the diaper that goes with them. <laughs> Almost ran out of those the last couple of days. So. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you about the battle that you face regarding free speech. And then I want to talk to you about why you are going to fix the country. Your generation, my generation, we're going to fix the country together. Because God knows that your parents and grandparents really, really screwed the pooch. And so did the professors at most major universities. And so did a lot of your fellow students. So most Americans on campus really don't have a clue why freedom itself matters, why it's an important thing. Freedom to them is actually sort of an inconvenience. They're more interested in feeling good about themselves than about learning new ideas or contemplating new arguments, all of which is actually a fair bit of work. To make themselves feel good, a lot of folks on the left have to have power, power over other people. And the way that they achieve power is by converting the students to the religion of feelings. Feelings are the left's chief way of quashing free speech. Too many people on the left believe the notion that if you claim you've been victimized, that means you get to shut everybody else up. The worse you feel, the more you get to use your power to quash other people. You know, President Obama says this about race relations and the police. Never mind the statistics. The only thing that matters is that some Americans feel put upon by the police. You don't actually have to show that the police are racist. All you have to do is feel that the police are racist, and then it is incumbent upon the police to change their behavior. And that means that everybody has to change based on feelings, not substantiated feelings, not justified feelings, just feelings. So President Obama, when he was in Dallas taking advantage of the mass murder of cops, he actually was at their memorial service and he said this, said, quote, in the end, it's not about finding policies that work. It's about forging consensus and fighting cynicism and finding the will to make change. Right, okay, if politics, if politics is not about finding policies that work, then what in the world is it about? 
Well, for the left, politics is not about finding solutions. It's about justifying feelings. And that's why the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage was a constitutional right, because the government had to confer dignity. This is actually in the decision, right? The government had to confer dignity on same-sex couples. But that's not the government's job. It's your job as a human being to act in a way that earns dignity from friends and from neighbors and from God. When I got married, I didn't look to the government to confer dignity upon, dignity upon me and my wife. The idea was supposed to be that I was deserving of dignity from her because I treated her well, and the same for her, and we earn dignity from our community by treating each other well and providing a home for our children. You earn dignity. It's not conferred just by some great God government that hands it down from on high. It's not government's job to confer dignity because government isn't your friend or your neighbor, and it is certainly not God. But the left tends to think that your government is these things because they are victims, and they have to have power to make themselves feel better, and they can't control godly power. They can't really control what people think of them, but they can control the government. The great God of government can control dignity. It can guarantee them dignity, and it can also withhold dignity from people who commit the ultimate blasphemy of saying, no, I am not going to bow down to this altar of government. And if you say no, if you're one of those people who says that you're not going to bow down to that altar, you become a thought criminal. And they've convicted you on campus of being a thought criminal because they believe that you have the means and the motive and the opportunity to commit the ultimate thought crime, not caving to their feelings. This is a thought crime, and you're a thought criminal. You are guilty. And again, means, motive, and opportunity. You have the means, first of all, because the means of not caring about their feelings is believing in facts more than you care about anybody's subjective feelings. Free speech has to be quashed, the left believes, if you refuse to abide by their rules. And they really have only one rule in the end, and that is no facts. Because facts are objectively not their feelings, right? Facts are something else. Facts are racist. Facts are sexist. Facts are mean and nasty and cruel because there's no way to reject facts for their implicit bias or for their white privilege or for their microaggressions. The left can reject you as a person, and they will, but they can't reject facts. Facts have a funny way of forcing people to listen. They're inconvenient, and therefore they're pernicious. Because the left's worldview is based on feelings, it's based on feeling good about themselves, the left isn't concerned really even with material equality so much as they're concerned with equality of feeling. They're threatened by facts. They've been taught by the government and their politicians that freedom isn't just doing what they want and then bearing the consequences of their actions. Freedom is doing what they want and, for and forcing other people to bear the consequences of their actions because that makes them feel better, right? It it's hard. If you have to bear the consequences of your own bad decisions, that might make you feel crappy. But it makes you feel better if you do bad things and then other people have to deal with that. It's everybody's job to pay your tuition. It's everybody's job to guarantee you a salary commensurate with your education. In reality, by the way, most college students, when they get out, are making a salary commensurate with their education, which is zero. Right, okay, the fact is that most of the things that you need to know in a real job, you learn on the job, by working a job. Okay, when I graduated from Harvard Law School, I was not qualified to be a lawyer. I was qualified to be a lawyer after I worked as a lawyer for a year, right? It's everybody else's job, though, to make them feel good about themselves. That is the most important thing. Everybody has to adjust them. Everybody has to adjust to them. But here's the thing. You really don't have an obligation to care about their feelings, and this is the kryptonite for the left is Superman. If you don't care about their feelings, they have no comeback because reality doesn't care about their feelings, and as I like to say, facts don't care about their feelings. So the left moves to quash all these facts with everything up to and including violence. Even the invocation of fact makes them upset. This is the philosophy of microaggressions they get on campuses like this one. Facts are microaggressions. Hell, even questions are microaggressions. So for example, University of Minnesota just gave librarians a 36-page identifying and responding to microaggressions PowerPoint training. I thought in a library the only microaggression was talking loudly, but apparently not. <laughs> According to the materials, librarians are supposed to correct students on their microaggressions. These include saying things like, where are you from? This is a micro uh, microaggression because it makes you subjectively feel bad for some reason, which is weird. I guess, that, I guess if you say, where are you from, you're implying that the person is not from here, which I know, I know you weren't born like right here. Where are you from? Right? But it's a microaggression, and it might make somebody feel bad. Or if you ask an Asian person for help with math, that apparently is a microaggression. So you have to specifically not ask the most intelligent Asian student in the class. You have to go to the person who's next to them, right? Because if you ask an Asian for help with math, it's like asking a Jew for help with accounting. <laughs> if you say that a qualified person should get a job, this apparently is a microaggression. The most qualified person should get a job because who knows? You might be offending the least qualified person in the room. They might feel offended. By the way, if you feel like you're the least qualified person in the room, there's a very good shot that you are, and you shouldn't be offended by anybody saying so. 
Or if you say, this is actually directly from their, their little manual. If you say men and women have equal opportunities for achievement, this is a microaggression too, because it's subjectively offensive. Except for the fact, of course, that women do have an equal opportunity for achievement, which is why in Time Magazine 2010, the 50 large, 47 of the 50 largest cities across the United States, women with equal education, time in the workforce, and no babies, they have exactly, not only exactly the same income, they actually have significantly higher income than men. Women out earn men. Women are the majority of people who are going to college in the United States. Women are now the majority of law students in the United States. Women are about half of medical students in the United States. Okay, women have plenty of opportunities in the United States, but if you say that, it's a microaggression because someone feels bad, and facts make people feel bad. There are even macro-level microaggressions, like around here, they, really, they say this, a macro-level microaggression is that all of the buildings around here are named after white heterosexual upper-class males. Okay, have you been to Minnesota lately? <laughs> and they're right, I guess we should just name all the buildings after RuPaul, just because. <laughs> and, and the thing is that, you know, these microaggression, this language of microaggression, it comes along with the idea that if you violate somebody's feelings, that they are able to be aggressive with you. They're supposed to be aggressive with you in response, right? Microaggressions, it's not just something I say that offends you, it's that you now get to get violent with me, right? That's what the language implies. I'm aggressing you, therefore you get to be aggressive with me in return, right? Aggression is met with aggression. And this is bled up into the upper echelons of the left. Any sort of factual conversation, anything that you say that can be taken subjectively in an offensive way, that justifies violence. So my personal experience with this comes courtesy of CNN Headline News. I don't know how many of you have ever seen CNN Headline News. Show of hands. Who's seen CNN Headline News? Great. That's the entire audience for CNN Headline News. Uh, CNN Headline News has no ratings, like none. Uh, and, uh, and they asked me, CNN Headline News, about a year and a half ago, they asked me to, uh, to come on to discuss Caitlyn Jenner. This is right when Caitlyn Jenner's story was breaking, and ESPN wanted to give Caitlyn Jenner the Hero of the Year Award. And my perspective just... Preliminarily, my perspective on, on transgenderism is that transgenderism is a tragic, horrible mental illness, and that people who suffer from it should be treated with nothing but sympathy, and that the idea that you can magically change a man into a woman or a woman into a man is anti-biology and anti-fact and foolish, and actually is encouraging delusion uh, and does not help anybody. And this comes as somebody who's had severe mental illness in the family, trying to humor the, de the delusions of people who are mentally ill doesn't do them any favors. And the fact is that transgender surgery doesn't do anything to lower the suicide rate. It doesn't, it's 40% before, it's 40% after. There's something that has to be done to help people, but it is not to pretend that sex doesn't exist, that men and women are, are not real, that, that you can just randomly change. That's my perspective on this. So CNN Headline News is doing this, this segment on, uh, on Caitlyn Jenner. And they looked up conservative in the white pages because they, you can do this in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and my name was the only one. And so I was the only conservative in a 30-mile radius of CNN headquarters uh, on Sunset Boulevard. And so they say, can you come in and do Dr. Drew's show about this? OK, sure. So I come in, and I get in the green room. And the producer comes up to me, and he says, you know, we here at CNN Headline News have no ratings. And I said, yes, I'm aware. And, <laughs> And he says, so we want to have a spicy conversation. We want to do something that's a little bit different. We'll have a spicy conversation. By the way, I used to produce for Jerry Springer. And it was at this point that I should have thought, this is not good. But being the intrepid sort, I decided to, to stick around. And they put me on set. And we sit down. And it's me and then three people to my right, all to the left. And then people in front of me is Dr. Drew and a couple of folks on the stage. They are also leftists. So it's me against six leftists, which makes it almost fair for them. So. <laughs> <laughs> and the debate begins. So the entire debate is the, the entire debate is is Caitlyn Jenner a hero or the greatest hero? Is Caitlyn Jenner should we, should Caitlyn Jenner be given an honorary medal of honor or should Caitlyn Jenner be granted an honorary spot in Arlington National Cemetery when he dies? Should Caitlyn Jenner be somebody who is, is actually made pope? Or should Caitlyn Jenner be built a golden magic chariot to take him to the sky, just like Elijah? Right? This, was the, this was the tenor of the debate. And then finally, Dr. Drew comes to me, and he says, do you think that Caitlyn Jenner deserves, how heroic do you think that Caitlyn Jenner is you know, on a scale of 10 to a bajillion? And, and I said, I really don't understand what's heroic about this at all. This is really tragic. You're, you're looking at somebody who, in profiles of him, explicitly said that he would undergo surgery and he'd come back and cry because he'd look at his face and realize what he was doing to himself, and then he'd have to call a mental health specialist to come in and convince him that what he was doing was right and okay. This is not something that, that is wonderful to be celebrated. I don't understand why society is humoring mass delusion. And, the, and uh, I neglected to mention one part of the story. Uh, the person sitting next to me is a transgender person. 
Uh, and the person sitting next to me was a, was a person named Zoe Turr. So Zoe uh, used to be Bob Turr, and Zoe uh, was not happy with what I was saying. So Zoe turns to me and says, you don't know anything about biology, little boy. Uh, he growls at me in a voice an octave lower than my own. And, <laughs> and, and I said, well, I do know that every cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body contains a Y chromosome, with, ironically, the exception of some of Caitlyn Jenner's sperm cells. And he, he keeps going, you know, you don't know anything about biology, little boy. You don't know anything about genetics, little boy. And after, you know, kind of pushing me for a couple of minutes, just saying the same thing over and over, you don't know anything about genetics, little boy, I finally turned to him and I said, well, what are your genetics, sir? And it was the sir that set him off. He reaches over, this is live on national television. He reaches over and he grabs me by the back of the neck on national TV. And he says, if you don't cut that out, I'll send you home in an ambulance. And honest to God, my first thought was, that doesn't even make sense. You don't go home in an ambulance. <laughs> but but, what, but what, I, what I said was, but what I said was, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political conversation. Well, the point of the story is that everybody on the panel, all the six people on the panel, all left. They, they, none of them say to, to Zoe, Zoe, that's completely inappropriate. Take your hands off. You can't commit assault and battery on a set of a national television show on live TV. That's probably bad policy. Instead, it was, Ben, how could you possibly say that to Zoe? You knew you would offend Zoe. And this was the whole point, right? The setup is, would anybody be willing to offend Zoe Turt, right? That was, that, that was what this whole thing was, because the left has to play identity politics. They don't want to have an open, honest conversation about transgenderism. Instead, they want to make it so that you have to insult someone and hurt their feelings and look like a jerk, right? That was the whole point. So the idea was, because I had said sir, which is what I typically say to men, right, then this, then, which was the entire debate, then I, I deserve to be treated with violence. That was, that was the basic idea here. And by the way, the threats of violence didn't stop afterward, even as the left was talking about how terrible I was. Right after this, Zoe, hulking out of the room, turns to me and says, I'll see you in the parking lot. And, and uh, the security had to escort me out to my car after one more segment. And then later, Zoe goes on, on Twitter uh, and threatens to curb stomp me, all of which I thought was deeply unladylike behavior. <laughs> but once you, you know, for, for, so for the left, the idea anyway is that if you speak facts, then this is a, this is a, ringing, this is a ringing endorsement of your own evil. Right? This just shows that you have the means to deny them what they want, which is you to feel bad about yourself. That's, what the left, that's how the left gets people. Right? The left tells you you're a bad person if you're not with them, and then you feel better about yourself if you, if you sort of surrender and say, yes, I'm with you, sure, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Okay? As a thought criminal, they also have to declare that you have a motive, right? and you do have a motive. Your motive is that you believe in individualism. Individualism is bad. Right? Individualism is judgmental. Because the thing about individualism is it suggests that some things you do are better than other things. Right? It suggests that some actions are smart and some actions are stupid. And this makes you hateful. This makes you judgmental. Individualism means that we will never achieve equality of outcome because some people are going to make better decisions than others. And that's racist and sexist and bigoted, we know, because that means that just by dint of statistics, certain groups will probably underperform other groups. If it turns out that one group of people with one skin color doesn't do as well as another group of people with a different skin color, the left believes that fairness of outcome has not been achieved, right? Individualism has gotten in the way of fairness of outcome, which is their highest priority when it comes to government. And that means that if fairness of outcome hasn't been achieved, somebody's a victim. Somebody has to be a victim. And if you want to know anything about the left, it's just look for the victim, right? They're, they're constantly looking for the victim. It means that the underachieving person can't have made bad decisions. They don't like individualism. The underachieving person hasn't made a bad decision. The underachieving person has been victimized by society because of their identity. Right? The left believes that freedom and liberty in America, the philosophy of individualism, it's insufficient. If it were sufficient, we'd all end up in exactly the same place. We don't. Inequality is inequity. Right? This is why the left focuses so much on income inequality. Right? In the real world, I don't care about income inequality. I care about there being a lot of poor people. I would like those poor people to be richer. But the left cares about income inequality, which suggests that the people on the top have stolen from the people on the bottom, which doesn't make any sense. The people on the bottom don't have anything, gang. Right? If you want to get rich, you don't steal from all the poor people. Right? So the fact is that income inequality doesn't mean anything, but for the left, it means everything. Because when they talk about income inequality, what they really mean is that poor people have been put upon by the system. The system has been cruel to these people. So if you're for individualism, according to the left, that means that your motive is to hurt other people. Free speech, which is just individualism and thinking, that hurts other people, so it must be stopped. And symbols of free speech have to be stopped too, since they're really just a ruse designed to mask America's evil. The flag has to be stopped. It's just a ruse, right? It's all designed to mask America's evil.
and the fact that it's a discriminatory system. The national anthem is bad. You have to protest it because the national anthem says that it's a free country and you got to do what you got to do and then bear the consequences of that. That's why last year the Minnesota Student Association voted not to participate in a 9-11 memorial because the unity against terrorism and in favor of America would hamper any effort to point out that America is deeply and horribly Islamophobic. Right? If, you, if we all surround 9-11 and we say we're going to do a memorial to 9-11, that suggests there's such a thing as bad, right? and they're, they're afraid of that. It says that America is a good country that's full of freedom, and we pay tribute to that. But that's bad because America isn't full of freedom. America is a bad country full of discrimination. The MSA director of diversity and inclusion, David Algadi, professional useless person, he said, the, he said the passing of this resolution in favor of a 9-11 memorial might make a space that is unsafe for students. Islamophobia and racism fueled through that are alive and well, right? Just because so you hold a memorial for 9-11 and this means that you are an Islamophobe and a racist. It seems to me that the thing that people should be afraid of at a 9-11 memorial is actually like radical Muslims killing people because it's a 9-11 memorial, right? If we focus on what we have in common, individual decency, we're not focusing on structural inequalities that plague society. That's why the left thinks individual, uh, individualism as a philosophy is insufficient. Finally, they know that you're a bad person because you're the thought criminal, we've done means, we've done motive, and then there's opportunity. And the opportunity is you have the opportunity to be the bad guy. The only way you can be a bad guy in America, according to the left, is if you are a beneficiary of privilege. And this one you hear all the time, right? You're a beneficiary of privilege that you cannot escape. You are born into a system that benefits white, heterosexual, cisgender men. If you're a white man, you must be taken down a peg. It's the only way. You're guilty. Felons don't have rights. Neither do beneficiaries of white privilege. You were born into sin. You must pay. And if you don't pay, then we, you'll dominate. So we have to take you down, right? And if you dominate, you will destroy the equality of diversity. You hear this refrain constantly from folks on the left. Commentators on MSNBC have said, Mark Lamont Hill said this, that only white people are capable of racism. Only white people are capable of racism, which comes as a shock to black people since there was a recent poll that showed that black people think that black people are more racist than white people. Really? It was a Rasmussen poll a couple years ago. Okay, the fact is that anybody can be racist because all that means is you're making negative judgments about people based simply on the color of their skin. But MSNBC said only white people can be racist since only white people are privileged enough to be in a position of power and therefore only they can be racist. Right? Hillary Clinton, say people on the left, she can't be a perpetrator. She's by nature a victim since she is a woman. You know who's bad? You are. By dint of birth, you must be deprived of your rights so that everyone can be equal. But here's the thing. In America, in a free country, Everybody is born into some form of privilege. Everybody is born into one form of privilege or another. Americans, all of us, are born into the privilege of being born into the freest, most prosperous nation in the history of the planet. That doesn't mean that we ought to just allow six billion people to inundate the United States. Some of us are born with two parents. This is the best privilege, right? If you're born with two parents, that's the best privilege. And that has nothing to do with white privilege. Okay, the fact is that the poverty rate among single-parent white homes is 22%. The poverty rate among two-parent black homes is 7%. What happened to white privilege? Why aren't the white people who are single mothers doing better than the black people who have two parents in the home? Well, the answer is that the decision was the privilege, right? The parents are the privilege, not the color. Some of us are born rich, some of us are born poor, some are born smart or tall or virtuous or handsome, and some of us are born Lena Dunham, right? Some of us are just... <laughs> You know, we're all born with certain advantages. By the way, I mean, she was born with advantages, too. She was born into a super wealthy Upper, e uh, upper East Side Manhattan apartment. I mean, it's not. Uh, it, it, she's born with certain advantages and certain disadvantages. Her disadvantage is that she likes to get naked on TV and she looks like a russet potato. You know, like, uh, there, there, there are advantages and disadvantages for everybody, but it's your job as a human being to do the best that you can with those advantages and disadvantages. Those cannot be equaled out. Those cannot be leveled out by any overarching government, because government isn't God. It can't fix those sorts of things. All we can do is ensure that everyone has equal rights that are protected, equal rights that are protected. In a free country, where we start off in life is not where we have to finish. And it isn't. In the United States, if you are in the bottom 20% of income earners in the United States, there is a 90% chance that within 15 years, you will be out of the bottom 20%. There's still tremendous income mobility in the United States. When people say there's the 1% and the 99, it's total nonsense. The people in the 1% shift all the time. I've been in the 1%, I've been outside the 1%. Most people who have been in the 1% have spent many years outside the 1%. People who are young, everybody in this room, you're poorer than people who are 20 years older than you are. Right? They will be higher on the income ladder. Is that because they stole from you? Or is it because they're older and they've spent more time in the job market earning? Right? We do live in a free society. 
Don't believe the crap that you hear about how white privilege is keeping people down today. Historically speaking, of course there was such a thing as white privilege. Of course there was Jim Crow. Of course there was slavery. And of course there are people who are still living in the after effects of history. We don't start, the world didn't start spinning when we were born, right? I live in the aftermath of a history in which my people got slaughtered in Europe. Right? Everybody has a different history. And some of that history is pretty terrible. But you can't punish the great-grandchildren of the people who sinned because their great-grandfather sinned. That's injustice. That's not equal rights. That is violation of equal rights. And it is not white privilege to live in a society where you are all given equal rights and expected to do the best with the circumstances you are given when you are born. And by the way, the Black Lives Matter movement suggestion that the criminal justice system is biased against black people is utter and complete nonsense. It's just not true, statistically speaking. Police are less likely to kill blacks than whites in similar situations. There's a study from Harvard University, Roland Fryer, Professor Roland Fryer, who's a black guy, his front page of the New York Times, like four months ago, there th he went through a thousand police shootings. He found that the cops were less likely to shoot black people than white people in similar circumstances. In 2015, there were 987 shootings in the United States, police shootings of people in the United States. Something like 26% of the people who were shot and killed were black. Something like 50% of the people responsible for murder in the United States are young black males. Okay, so the idea that there's something wildly disproportionate going on where cops are just looking for black people to shoot, it's not true. It's just not true. You know, as far as sentencing inequalities, people like to talk about crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. The idea that white people do, do powder and black people do crack, and therefore the different sentences are a reflection of racism. There's only one problem with that. Crack and powder are not the same thing. Crack is significantly more addictive. It is significantly more easy to distribute. And uh, not only that, the people who originally pushed for harsher sentences on crack cocaine were black legislators from the inner city who are sick of watching their communities ravaged by crack cocaine. If you actually want to look at two drugs that are, that are similar, you look at crystal meth, which is a white people drug, and crack cocaine, which is a black people drug in terms of arrest. 85% okay, of the people arrested for crystal meth are white. The sentences for an ounce of crystal meth and, the ounce, and an ounce of crack cocaine are exactly and precisely the same under federal law. So you're comparing apples and oranges when you compare the two different types of cocaine, but that's what everybody likes to do. In 1994, the DOJ did a survey of felony cases all around the United States, 75 locations all around the United States. They found black people were significantly less likely than white people to be prosecuted for felony offenses. Why? Because black communities are under-policed, not over-policed, as BLM would have you believe. If you kill the myth of privilege, it kills the left's ability to shut you down. They should be arguing about the merits of your argument, not about your identity. I, had a, I was interviewing with a, a woman from Esquire magazine today, and she could not get this through her head. She kept saying, why are all the Trump people so upset? I said, because you keep, you keep attacking them as bad people, as racists, without evidence. Okay, if you keep doing that, they're going to ignore your arguments. If you want to have a legit argument, we can have a legit argument, but the left's ideas all rest on the premise that you are a bad human being, and they know you're a bad human being because of your color or because of your income level, and that's a problem. So because you're a thought criminal, you have to be silenced, and they'll try and silence you by shouting white privilege or, microaggress or microaggressions or pretending that you've invaded their safe spaces. Yesterday at University of Wisconsin, I spoke, and a bunch of students uh, made a pretty big ruckus. You can check it out online. Uh, and, uh, and some of the students stood up and started chanting safety, to which I asked who farted. But they, but they started chanting safety, <laughs> And, uh, and, and I, I asked them, I said, I don't understand. You're standing there chanting safety in a room full of these evil conservatives, many of whom supported Donald Trump. For the record, by the way, I didn't vote for either of the main candidates. Uh, and, uh, and they're standing there chanting. I said, do you feel unsafe? To me, you see, this is probably the safest place for you, right? I mean, you're here, you're shouting at us, you're disrupting our event, and nobody is doing anything to you. Nothing. But this is, the left has to imply that you are unsafe to them. They need a safe space, so shut up. The real safe space, I mean, it already exists on these campuses. I mean, really, their safe space, their, their imaginary safe space, is, it exists. It's their basement where they have Bernie Sanders posters and weed. <laughs> they want control. They want control of society, of your life, of your ability to resist, of your will to resist. And in return for that control, they will tell you a lie, that you will feel better about yourself. You will feel really good. And that feeling lasts as long as you don't achieve anything, and it lasts not very long at all. It turns out that achievement is the only path to really feeling good about yourself. That's what we have to fight, and that's where you folks come in. You're not thought criminals, and that's because you believe in, this is kind of cheesy, but the Superman trifecta. You do believe in truth and justice in the American way. And those are the only things that are worth fighting for. You know, when it comes to truth, truth only exists in the realm of facts. It doesn't exist in the realm of the feelings. When people on the left cite things that are not true, and then you say, that's not true. And they say, you're denying my truth. 
Your truth is a lie if it does not comply with the truth. There's no such thing as your truth. There is just your opinion or your feelings. And I can't get inside your head. I can't be you, thank God. I can't do that, right? I can't, get, I can't have your feelings. I can't be privy to your truth. But here's the thing, you don't get to make up your own truth in the public square and then claim that everybody else has to comply with your truth. Second, it's your job to press for justice, right? America's breaking down into tribes, and this really is scary because it's happening both left and right. President Obama broke us up according to sort of racial tribes to exploit that tribalism for votes. And he drove those tribes out to vote very, very strongly in 2012. And now you've seen on the right, people have done that with other tribes. When I say tribalism, I just mean people voting according to, uh, according to a feeling of racial solidarity. And it doesn't matter what the race is. Right? When the left speaks about social justice, this is another form of tribalism. Right? Social justice is the idea that individualism, individual justice has to be trumped in the name of the group. Right? So for example, in Ferguson, Missouri, Officer Darren Wilson shoots Michael Brown, right? justifiably, by all available evidence. The right answer there is, he did it justifiably, he shouldn't go to jail. The way the left viewed that was, he's a white officer, Michael Brown was a black guy, therefore he should go to jail. Social justice is injustice. Social justice is not just. Social justice is corrupt. It is anytime, justice doesn't need an, an, an amendment, it doesn't need an addendum. Anytime you add a word to justice, all you're doing is corrupting the word itself. We're not members of groups, we're individuals responsible for our own actions. And finally, you should stand up for Americanism. You know, freedom amounts. What freedom in the end really is, it's the idea of God-given rights protected by a government based on the consent of a moral and religious people. Leftists believe that freedom amounts to government-given rights. That's what leftists believe, that government gives you rights. Conservatives believe that government power is an obstacle to your rights. Leftist power, leftists believe your rights are an obstacle to government power. Leftists offer Americans a seductive, un-American promise. All your problems will be solved if you just hand us all power and you will feel so much better about yourself. That's what politicians on the left say. It's what some politicians on the right say. Politicians are constantly telling you if you just give them more power, they will make you feel good. They'll fix all of your problems. They're not going to solve your problems. This is America. Solve your own problems. You are free. That's the wonderful thing about this country. That makes things hard because you are expected to be free. You're expected to solve your own problems. And guess what? Nobody cares enough about you in America to stop you. Really, the, the idea that there are people who are scheming somewhere to stop you and groups of people just like you, that they're sitting around thinking, how do I stop LGBTQ people? How do I stop gay people? How do I stop black people? How do I stop Jews? How do I stop women? Nobody's doing that. No one cares. You as an individual, it's your job to go out in the real world and succeed. And that doesn't mean anybody is obligated to give you a hand up, although many people are happy to do that. What it does mean is that everyone is obligated not to get in your way. People are obligated not to hurt you. If we can agree on that, then we can agree on America, and we can agree, we'll actually have a social fabric that's worth fighting for. We'll actually have a common cause that we can, that we can fight for. Decency, right? being a good person, making decisions that help you and help your family and help your society, and make you better at what you do. That's what we should all be striving for, not this victim mentality that suggests that some people have to shut up because other people feel bad. So long as we are living in the world of feelings, we can't, down to the world, we can't get down to the world of facts. And here's the root fact that makes America so great. You are free to be your own person and to do the best that you can for yourselves, for your family, for your children, and for your country. You know, Ronald Reagan said that freedom is always one generation away from extinction. But freedom is always one generation away from revitalization. We can be that generation if we believe in the individual, if we shut down the social justice warriors, if we stop the nonsense about how freedom should take a secondary place to feelings. We can all fight for that together. We should all fight for individual justice and, indiv and, and, and objective truth. If we don't do that, we're not fighting for anything beyond our own destruction. Thanks so much, happy to take questions. So. Privilege of, uh, of going first. 
And by the way, thanks, guys. It's the first time in three nights that I've actually been able to get through a speech. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I'm not on the left, but um, as someone who's nearly 10 years your senior, I hope to grow up to be just like you someday. <laughs> um, I've been reading Russell Kirk, Edmund Burke, T.S. Eliot, uh, you know, some of these great, William Buckley, some of these great mm -hmm. conservative thinkers. Um, and as I've been doing this and I've been studying you, I actually just finished reading your short, How to Debate a Leftist. Um, I'm, I'm impressed by your incredible ability to, the, you're probably one of the greatest political thinkers in the country right now. And That's kind of you, thank I, you. Um, Your check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question, or real quickly, is do you have any other authors besides Ben Shapiro that you would recommend for guys like me who want to understand the depth of true conservatism as it was founded? Well, I mean, if you want to understand true conservatism as, as it was founded, really the only way to do that is to read the founding documents, right? Nobody, Everybody says they've read the Federalist Papers, but nobody actually has. Mm -hmm. You should read the Federalist Papers, you should read the Anti-Federalist Papers, it gives you both sides of the equation. Uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, Harry Joppa uh, has, has a bunch of books about Lincoln that are really good because he sort of talks about what Lincoln did to change the nature of the founding or to fulfill the founding through the Civil War because there's still big debate about whether Lincoln went too far in violating states' rights. Uh, the answer is, is no, there was slavery, but the, <laughs> but, uh, but, it's, but the books are really good. Um, th there are a lot of good books on conservatism. I really have to do it by topic. If you listen to my podcast, I actually recommend almost a book a day. Uh, at the very end, I do things I like, and I always recommend a book, a movie, a TV show, like one thing a day, basically. Uh, and the list has gotten long. We've done 200 odd episodes, um, but it's uh, it, it sort of depends on the, for for people who are who are just looking for basic primers. Uh, I would recommend Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. It's like 150 pages. You can read it in in a sitting, uh, and it's uh, it's a really good kind of fundamental basis for for how economics works. Uh, that that's a good place to start to Hazlitt H yes. H A Z L I T T. Okay, and then the other the last question. Selfishly, I like to write and write on mm -hmm. conservative topics. Who do I get a hold of with the Daily Wire to maybe? Work I mean, you can email me, bshapiro at dailywire dot com. Okay. And uh, we, we all we do take submissions. We do a lot of places don't, but we do take submissions. Thank so you. absolutely. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> you can be a on, on anything. It doesn't have to be about what I talked about. Oh, Game of Thrones. Anyway, <laughs> Westworld theories. By the way, I do have a great Westworld theory, and it's totally true. But in any case, it happens. Well, hi. So I, I was really interested in a lot of the points made about how like microaggressions and things like that are almost they get to the point where it's like self-parodying. Yes. But uh, how emblematic do you think things like that are of the general college experience for someone like me or anybody in this room? Uh, I mean, it depends. I mean, I can't speak for your experience. Again, I'm not here. You are. Um, but it has become a major issue on, on college campuses where anytime somebody does something that anybody perceives as mildly racist, even if it's not meant to be or even if it isn't, uh, then there's a major protest and they sit outside administration buildings and they try to shut down the campus. There are professors who will, who will warn people about certain terms they can and cannot use and shut down conversation based on it. That's why I cited the example from uh, U of M libra uh, librarians over here. Um, you know, only you can say how much that matters to you in your daily life. It's possible that you never experienced that. When I was in college, I didn't experience much of it either. Um, but it has become a pretty major national issue. Uh, and uh, and since you know, since Trump's election, I think it's going to get worse because now all the snowflakes are melting. And and again, as somebody who didn't support Donald Trump, it is kind of delicious to watch people uh, just immerse themselves in their own tears. I mean, professors excusing classes because they because people didn't like that Trump was elected. Well, listen, folks. I mean. The, the, the security that I work with, both of them fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think you can handle the fact the person you, you didn't want to be elected was elected. I think it'll be okay. I think you'll live. So, you know, I think it's going to get worse, not better, is what I'm saying to you. Um, but as far as your experience, I mean, you'll have to tell me. Yeah, well, I just, it seemed like you were kind of generalizing that to yeah. be emblematic of the left in general on campus, and I feel like that's pretty inaccurate. Like, certainly there's some people that think Yeah, that. I, think that's, I think that's true. I think there are a lot of people on the left who don't do that. Um, and, and that's great. And, let's, and, and that's why, by the way, I use the term left as opposed to liberal. You notice I don't use the word liberal. Right? I, don't, I, think, I don't think it's actually proper. There's a definitional difference. Liberals actually believe in liberalism. right? They actually still believe in the idea that you should be able to say what you want to say. Jonathan Chait is somebody I disagree with about everything. But Jonathan Chait is somebody who doesn't believe in political correctness or microaggressions or any of this nonsense. Uh, people on the left do. right? That's why I actually I do make a philosophical distinction between the two. Okay, thanks. thanks. Hi, I'm a 
huge fan. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so um, this whole election cycle, everyone kept talking about how um, we should have more than two parties in the U.S. Mm -hmm. What's your thought on that? Uh, we don't need more than two parties. We just need not crappy candidates. Uh, the, 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 problem with the, the, the problem is that the system is sort of built for two parties because it's such a large country and because you need a major infrastructure in order to run a party. There could have been a legit third party this time, but it turns out the libertarians were too busy smoking weed to actually do anything about it. They, uh, the libertarians blew such an unbelievable opportunity in, in this election cycle, and instead they ran Gary Johnson, who if he – I mean I'm, I'm actually pro-marijuana legalization. But he makes a very strong case against me. <laughs> and it, it's, what is Aleppo? Uh, but it's, it's, but it's, it's, it, 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 there could be a bad, I think that if the Republican Party continues to move in the direction of Trumpism, I do think there will be a third party. Because I think that Trumpism is not conservatism. There's still a lot of constitutional conservatives who are not comfortable with the idea of a big government guy who just really believes in closed borders and tariffs. Uh, and it, it depends who Trump is, right? Trump may govern as a conservative. He may shock me, right? He shocked me in this election. I thought that, that he was going to lose. Uh, obviously, he didn't. Uh, everybody, to be fair, everyone thought he was going to lose, including Trump, right? Everyone thought he was going to lose, except for Bill Mitchell, who's high off his own fumes. But, that, but he was right, so apparently it's good stuff. Um, so, it, you know, it sort of depends on what Trump does. May, I hope he's, he surprised me in winning the election. I hope he surprises me in, in how he governs. I don't think he'll surprise me as a human being, because I think that at 70 years old, uh, unless he has some sort of like Paul on the road to Damascus conversion, uh, he, he's pretty set in his ways. So, thank you. Sure. Yeah, so uh, what do you think historically, um, how did Jew hatred arise historically? Mm -hmm. And um, we see it on both sides of the political spectrum in America. Why do yeah. you think that is? Uh, well, there are different types of Jew hatred. So not all types of Jew hatred are exactly the same. So there have really been three main strains of Jew hatred. One is religious Jew hatred, right, which is like old school Christianity during the Crusades, right? The Jews killed Jesus, and now we're going to take him out, right? Or modern radical Islam in the Middle East. The Jews are bad, therefore we're going to murder all of them. Uh, that's, that's one strain of, of anti-Semitism, and that's the most virulent strain, right? Because if you religiously believe you have to do away with the people, it's kind of scary. Uh, and then there's the, then there's kind of left-wing anti-Semitism, and then there's, uh, and then there's kind of quasi-right-wing anti-Semitism. The, the, the left-wing anti-Semitism uh, is based on the premise that, on this Marxist premise, that everybody ought to finish in the same place. So right now, the reason the left has moved against Israel, for example, is Israel is successful, all of its neighbors are not, therefore Israel must have victimized all of its neighbors. And, that is, and that's led to this, this tremendous rise in the idea that Jews are somehow victimizing people, that's why they're so successful, uh, they're, they're too, too successful a group. And that exists uh, on the far left, and unfortunately it's starting to kind of mainstream itself through anti-Israel and anti-Zionism into actual anti-Semitism. Uh, on the right, uh, there's a group of people who believe that Jews are sort of interlopers uh, in Western civilization. This is the alt-right. Uh, and I didn't even believe that this was a thing until this election cycle. When I was named by the, uh, the Anti-Defamation League this year, I was named as the number one target of white supremacy in, in the United States as a journalist. Uh, there were something like 20,000 anti-Semitic tweets sent between the beginning of the year and May. I was the personal recipient of 8,000 of them. Uh, and uh, so thir it was like 38% came to me. Uh, and uh, they were like full-on Nazi memes, like Jews being shot in the head, um, gas chamber memes with, of course, this was after I, uh, I didn't decide to back Donald Trump. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that does exist on, on wings of the alt-right. The alt-right believes uh, that Western civilization is inherently connected to European race, uh, which doesn't even make sense because European race predates Western civilization by several tens of thousands of years, right? There were lots of people in Britain before Western civilization came about. Uh, but this belief is that the Jews are sort of, uh, they, they can't be trusted, that biology is inherently connected with culture, which is a bunch of crap, and that Western civilization is a product of Christendom, not a product of, of, of Judeo-Christianity, and so the Jews have to be sort of cast out. Uh, and so there, there are a bunch of different strains. The reason that it's rising right now uh, in Europe is because, uh, first of all, a lot of it is actually coming from new Muslim immigrants, but second of all, there is that feeling among Europeans. There's also a guilt feeling among a lot of European countries. They're sick of hearing about the Holocaust, and so they're going to try and portray Israel as a new Holocaust state, so they don't have to feel so bad about what happened. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex topic, but uh, it is unfortunate that, that anti-Semitism seems to be on the rise again. Thank you, big fan.
Hi Ben, huge fan. Oh, thank you. Um, my question has to do with Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. um, some people say that it is unjust to hold these people prisoner since they have not received a fair trial. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on this topic? Uh, you're not entitled to a fair trial if you are not an American citizen. So, the, so the, the, you know, under the Constitution of the United States, uh, you're not entitled to due process of law. Uh, that is particularly true if you're attempting to kill American soldiers on the battlefield. Uh, they will, in time, be tried. They have been tried by military tribunal. That's not the same thing as a civilian trial. Um, you know, also, it is significantly more difficult to, to try people on the basis of terror connections when you don't know who they are. You just know that they were on the field in a civilian area shooting at you. It's actually very important that we not treat enemy combatants as, so, as prisoners of war. They're not the same thing. Prisoners of war and enemy combatants are not the same thing legally. The reason for that is that the Geneva Conventions were specifically designed to make people fight in uniform and try to force them away from civilian areas. Right? That was the whole goal. The whole goal of the Geneva Convention is, if you're in uniform, we'll treat you as a, as a, as a soldier, and therefore you're entitled to certain rights under the Geneva Convention, and including the idea that you're repatriated when the war is over. Right? I mean, the, the Geneva Conventions are pretty clear about a lot of this stuff. The same thing is not true for people who explicitly disobey the other provisions of the Geneva Conventions. If you're out of uniform, if you're going into a civilian area, specifically making it so that civilians have to be murdered in order for us to capture you, you should not be treated with the same sort of care and loving kindness, because the fact is that we are trying to encourage you not to do that. So, you know, as far as the, the, the so-called you know, so rights of, of people who are gathering in civilian areas so that people have to be, you know, babies and women have to be killed, uh, in order for us to get them before they kill Americans, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that position. Thank you. Um, so I recently read Black Rednecks and White Liberals, mm -hmm. and um, I thought there were some really great points, uh, but I'm wondering if you completely buy the case that basically the redneck culture that moved to the South basically became black ghetto culture Kind of yes, yeah, so that's the case. Tom, for those who haven't read the book, that's Thomas Sowell's case. So he's trying to explain why the rate of violence in black communities is much higher than the rate of violence <laughs> in white communities. And what he does is he says, look at the rates of violence among southern communities, white southern communities, versus the rates of violence among northern white communities. And then he actually traces it back to uh, actually their ancestors in Scotland, right? He says, like, there's a certain group of people in Scotland who sort of occupied the south, very different from the population that occupied the north. And it was much more of an honor culture. It was much more of a culture about defending yourself. So I buy some of it. I do. I buy, I buy a lot of it, actually. Um, to me, the, the reason that it has maintained and not gone down is it has, but first of all, the rates of southern white violence are still much higher than the rates of northern white violence. So there obviously is some truth to the, to the cultural argument. But, the, but on top of that is the fact that black communities for a long, and he makes this argument too, black communities for a very long time, uh, since really Jim Crow, have been under-policed. And so if, if communities are under-policed, then you end up with tribal, tribal revenge scenarios. Right? This is true in every place from Afghanistan to Mexico City to black communities where, where there's no overarching police force. Right? If somebody kills somebody in my family, my response is, I'm going to go kill somebody in your family. And then the response is, I'm going to kill somebody in your family. Right? You, you set up gangs specifically in order to defend your turf, and it becomes incredibly tribal. So one of the things that has to be done in order to correct this, there are really two main factors, I think, driving violence disproportionately in the black community. One is the disproportionate single motherhood rate. Boys need fathers. Uh, you need somebody to whoop your ass if you do something wrong. Uh, and mom won't do it. I mean, you can't do that. If you're teen any, there's not a teenage boy in the world afraid of his mother. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and, uh, and beyond that, uh, there needs to be much more policing. Uh, and law-abiding people in inner city communities know this because they actually would like to live in a place where people can come and build a business and invest and create jobs and break the cycle and provide tax dollars for the local schools and all the rest of it. So uh, you know, as far as the roots of it, I do buy some of the argument. You know, I'm not sure that it explains everything. Right. No, I think a lot of the... I, I think a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of parallels there's a lot of strains, in, yeah. in whatever, but I just can't figure out how, like, the, you know, the culture would permeate like that, you know, from two different kind of separate <laughs> cultures. Well, no, I mean, it could permeate if you, if you hold the people in bondage for, you know, uh, yeah. 200 years, yeah. uh, then they, they're going to tend, many, many of these people were born into a particular culture, which was a mashup of, you know, the home culture and also this southern white violent culture. That's essentially the argument that Sol is making. You grew up in a culture. The slaves grew up in a culture, right? And that culture is shaped by the circumstances that surround them. So, I, so, I, so you know, the, the, the reason that he's making this case for those who missed it is that there's a, the countervailing case is the one that's made by people on the alt-right, 
which actually is racist, right? Which is that black people are more prone to violence because of their race. That's a bunch of crap, right? Because the fact is that there are peaceful black people, there are plenty of peaceful black communities. Black people overachieve when they're put in charter schools. It's just, some of it is circumstance, some of it is culture, um, but to try and blame it on race itself, that actually, now you get into the realm of actual racism. Right, well, and then where he brought in, like, uh, I think, people coming from Jamaica who are black, who are basically outperforming. Yeah, 100%, black there's, there's there, there's a, not, not right, exactly. America likes to see people as black and white, yeah. but that's ignoring there's a massive amount of diversity among black folks, right? Just like there's a massive amount of diversity among white folks. Right? My, my people are from like Lithuania, Russia. You know, a lot of people in Minnesota, their, their ancestors are from the Netherlands and, and Sweden. You know, the idea that, the idea that you're going, that all of those are white people is just, it's silly. I mean, these these labels are too broad. One real quick thing. Um, do you have do you have a, sorry? Do you have a list of all the books that you recommend on your podcast? I need to, I need to have somebody go through and do it because yeah. it's it has, it's, it's it's now it's like 150 200 things. So yeah. Thanks. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. Sure. So in the week after the election, I have a lot of friends who um, did or were at one point Bernie supporters, but ended up voting for Hillary and. I don't know how accurate this map is, but I've been seeing it reposted a lot about if millennials yeah. have been taken into the equation. Yes. And how blue the map was of how many people would have voted for Hillary and how she would have won the vote. She would have won like everything, right? Everything, yeah. yeah. So it's I mean, it really bothered me, and it's bothered me for a while because honestly, before I started listening to your podcast and Clayton's podcast, mm -hmm. I really been, I guess you could call it, closeted conservative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. My question is, does it worry you? I mean, seeing maps like that yes, of course in the next it, 10, 20, 30 years, um, and I guess what can I do so, personally to like talk to my friends yeah. and other people that, you know, to, you know just, I mean, to prevent a person like Bernie Sanders, who's so yeah. far left, that's all that we don't move in that direction. Right. So I think that, that so there, there's a lot to, there, there are a lot of things to unpack there. Um, the, the first thing, to say is that the reason that socialism is on the rise and the reason that, that kind of big government is on the upsurge uh, is because people need a cause to fight for. Young people particularly, they want to change the world. And they look at the status quo and they say, okay, what's a cause I can fight for? And it's very difficult for a lot of people to say, I'm gonna fight for a system that just gives me a better car. I'm gonna fight for a system that gives me a better shot at a job. Right? The big mistake Republicans have made typically is they don't talk in moral terms. My, this entire speech was in moral terms, right? I like to talk in moral terms because that's actually what appeals to people. Everybody thinks of politics in moral terms, they just don't want to admit it to themselves. They like to think that they just, they're looking for the best solution, it's not true. Right? People who like Bernie don't like Bernie because they think anything he's gonna do is gonna work because it's a bunch of crap, right? They, they like Bernie because he's saying there's injustice in the world and I alone can solve, right? And, and People like Trump sort of do the same thing, right? He does the I alone can solve routine, and people go, yeah, that sounds great. If you're part of a cause that's better than being not part of a cause, and the left provides a moral cause that's actually immoral in my view. Uh, as far as what you can do personally to overcome that, two things. One is you can find people on the left who are actually willing to have open discussions, which you actually have to determine whether a conversation is worth it or not. Some conversations aren't. Some conversations are just people you know, wanting to mouth off, and you're on your deathbed 30 years, you know, hopefully well, 70 years from now. You're, you're on your deathbed, and you're thinking to yourself, my God, I wish I had those two hours on a Facebook back, because that was <laughs> such a waste of time. Uh, and, and, you know, so you have to gauge whether that's a worthwhile conversation or not. Um, but if you have people who you can talk to, it's always worthwhile having those conversations and trying to convince them. Also, just be a good person. The better conservatives are as human beings, the harder it is for them to declare that we're, they're horrible. And once you actually break their, their, their self-proclaimed uh, monopoly on virtue, it's very difficult for them to deal with that. As far as millennials and, and how they're gonna go, some, it's not quite as worrisome to me uh, for, for one reason, which is that as millennials get older, just like every other generation, they get more conservative. I am fearful that they're gonna get less conservative as they get older because they've grown up in a, in a more left-leaning country. Uh, and also, uh, you know, this was one of my concerns with Trump is that the groups that he is very unpopular with are the growing demographics in America, right? Women, minorities, young people, these are all the growing demographics in the country, right? He, he won a bare victory, right? He, he lost the popular vote. He won a very, very slim victory on the basis of a few tens of thousands of votes in Wisconsin and Ohio and Michigan uh, and, and Florida. And all of that victory can also be explained by the fact that no one showed up to vote for Hillary Clinton, right? A lot of your friends who voted for Bernie, they, they say they voted for Hillary. A lot of people didn't vote for Hillary. Right, Hillary Clinton, from 2012 to 2016, somewhere between four and five million Democrats did not show up. That's a massive number. 
right? She lost like, she lost eight to 10% of the number of people who voted for Barack Obama. That's an amazing, amazing number, right? And in 2008, since then, she's lost seven to eight million votes. So nobody showed up for Hillary. So looking at this like it's a brand new coalition and everything is swimmingly gonna go on, it's, it's just, it's not accurate. And so it's important that for the next four years, Donald Trump doesn't make an ass out of himself by saying he's gonna grab women by the bleep and, and that he doesn't like Mexican judges and all the rest, right? Because that alienates people, it turns out. Um, and so, you know, it's important for him not to do that. Will he do that? I don't know. Can anyone control him? Mm -hmm. you, know, <laughs> you know, you sort of hope that, that he goes back to being chained up in the basement like he was the last couple of weeks, and then Robot Trump takes the stump, and he just does that for four years. That would be better. Um, but, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to see what he does. Maybe, maybe, he'll, maybe he'll shock everyone and grow into the office. Uh, stranger things have happened. Not many, but stranger things have happened. So, but, but it is important that it, Republicans do for the next four years, at least the next two, before there's a congressional election, and I think they'll do well next time also because the, the map looks good for Republicans. Uh, for the next couple, four years, they have to do a really good job of promoting good policy, but also reaching out to millennials, reaching out to black people, reaching out to Hispanics, reaching out to women, uh, and that's gonna require Trump to become something different than he's been, which is a little bit humble. And uh, we'll see if he's capable of that. Thank you. So, um... So as a, as a classical liberal, right, mm -hmm. as someone who believes in liberty, someone who uh, believes in facts and believes in individualism sure. and, and doesn't, doesn't hate conservatives, thinks <laughs> that conservatives are my ally, do you think there's any hope for people like me to run a, a reasonable conversation on actual ideas yes. uh, instead of just this name <laughs> to take back or at least push the left back into our camp and kind of get these neo-progressive crazies? At least I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I do think I do, I do think there is. I mean, if I if I didn't think that, I wouldn't do what I do for a living. You know, I think that in the end, fact and moral and morality will will rise again. But I think you actually have to spout facts and morality and staying calm and not getting super angry is, is a good way uh, is a good way of doing that. I also think that uh, as we move toward a conservative libertarian merger, which is really what's happening uh, in there's two ways of looking at Trumpism. One is that it's a big government conservatism. Uh, which is not really conservative. It's sort of a big government nationalist populism. The other way is that Trump really put social issues to the side, uh, and so there's sort of been a conservative libertarian merger. Uh, I would hope that it's more of a conservative libertarian merger, that, that basically conservatives say to libertarians, you guys are right, the government shouldn't be involved in anything, and libertarians say to conservatives, you guys are right, you do need a moral people in order to have liberty. If that sort of agreement can be made, then I do think that's a winning message. Because I, I, I think with most millennials, if you say to most millennials, look, stop being a nosy jerk, Right, you, my business is my business, your business is your business. I thought that was the purpose of, of, you know, you think that about sex and drugs, I think that about religion. Why don't we actually just get together on this? We can all do what we wanna do, let's leave each other alone. Stop being such, you know, stop being such a uh, uh, controlling freak. I think that people on the left understand that on a root level. I think that's why they, I think that's why so many, by the way, a lot of people on the left voted libertarian this time, because they thought that's what Gary Johnson was. He isn't that. We actually had in this election a Democrat running as a Republican, a Democrat running as a Democrat, a Democrat running as a Libertarian, and a Democrat running as a Green Party member. Um, but you know that. But that said, yeah, it, I think there is a, a movement toward Libertarianism that, that could be appealing to a lot of people on the left who have had the uh, who have had the sort of moral superiority to say that conservatives are just about you know keeping gays in the closet and such. All right. Excellent. Thanks. Thank Hi, I'm also a big fan. Oh, thank you, I appreciate it. So I guess several years ago, I remember a time when whenever you said something that was offensive, the worst you could be called was just like a jerk or an a-hole, or you'd just be regularly offensive. But now all of a sudden, they label you with all these different keywords like racist, sexist, misogynist, all that stuff. And especially with the election, like even the mention of Trump's name was all of a sudden a keyword. So yeah. like, where, like, What's the point of all of that? Like, why are they doing this? I mean, the, the reason they do that is because they don't want to have the conversation. So if they call you a racist, they no longer have to discuss with you. Or if they call me a racist, they no longer have to have a conversation. Why would you have a conversation with a racist? Right? Would you have a conversation with a guy in a KKK hood? No, that's why they say we're all members of the KKK, right? You and me, we're the two members of the KKK. <laughs> <laughs> The whole, the, the whole reason, it, it's very funny, the left is constantly talking about, you can't other people, right? You can't make people feel like the other. But that's what the left constantly does with the right. They're constantly saying, you guys are the other, right? You're racist, sexist, you're terrible people, so we don't have to have a conversation with you. That's the goal. And if you can get past that, then you can win the conversation. You can actually have a good discussion. 
But the first thing you have to do is take away the feeling of unearned moral superiority. And that means that the, the way to get past this is a very simple trick. When somebody says you're a racist without evidence, you say, no, you're an asshole. <laughs> really, this is a thing you should say. Because there is no excuse for calling somebody a racist without evidence. It's the worst thing you can call somebody in America. And if you do it without any evidence, this makes you a bad person. And so you have every, you're well within your rights to say that you are not allowed to throw slurs at people without any evidence that the slur is true. Because that's just a way to shut down conversation. That's the only, it's the only real comeback. Because if you start trying to discuss with them, you've already lost the argument, right? They say, you're a racist. And you go, no, let me explain why I'm not a racist. You're, it's, it's already over. The conversation's over because you're now saying to the person who called you a racist that they are a reasonable person with whom you can have a conversation. Therefore, it's reasonable to think that you might be a racist. Right? So you have to say, no, it's not reasonable to think I might be a racist. You're not a reasonable person. We're not having a conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, uh, I can't say I'm a big fan or anything, but I've seen you on YouTube a few times. OK, well. <laughs> give, it to, give it time. I'll grow on you. I think you're an intelligent and logical person. So um, I am a relatively liberal-leaning person. Uh, what do you think of the state of health care in the United States right now? And do you think Obamacare is working? And do you think single-payer health care could work? And how do you feel about Trump? Right. OK, so a so, lot, obviously, there, too. OK, so Obamacare is not working because Obamacare was designed to fail. Obamacare was designed to make health care more expensive so that, the, so that the left could put in place a single-payer health care system. Right? Obama originally wanted a public option. He didn't get it because that was stonewalled, essentially. Right, so, they, so Obamacare was never designed to work. It's not working. When he says more people are on insurance, yes, it turns out when you put the government gun to people's heads and say you have to buy insurance or we will fine you, and if you don't pay the fine, you'll go to jail, people will do it, right? <laughs> it's like saying there's a government mandate to buy car insurance. Wow, suddenly everybody's got car insurance. If you mandate things from the government, more people do it. It's not effective because, again, you, if you like your doctor, you couldn't keep your doctor. If you like your insurer, you couldn't keep your insurer. More and more insurers are dropping out of Obamacare because the strictures are too much. So a lot of states only have one insurance company, if any, that are actually even offering the kind of plans that Obama wanted offered. Uh, most of the people, the vast majority of people, as, as late as the end of 2015, I think it was well over 90% of the people who had actually been added to the rolls were because of expansions to Medicaid, not because of Obamacare. So that was just more expansion of public spending, which is basically just the public option. Uh, as far as what needs to happen in health care and would a single payer option work? So here's what single payer is good for, here's what it's bad for. Single payer is very bad for attracting new doctors because doctors don't get paid enough in single payer systems. This is why there are black markets in Israel and the UK and in Canada. Right? Every place that has a single payer system, people come to America if they need a major surgery because it just doesn't work that way. It's good for emergency care because already we basically have, the truth is we already have basically a backdoor version of single payer for emergency care in the United States. If you don't have insurance, you just go to the ER. And then we end up making the insurance company pay. My wife's a doctor. So they, 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 you know, they end up paying extra money, and the state ends up subsidizing, and people cover the cost. Right? If you, you can, it's against the law across the United States to refuse somebody care in an ER, whether they have insurance or not. So you, so you're already, you do have a basic standard of sort of single payer already just because of those laws. The biggest problem in healthcare is not insurance. The biggest problem is undersupply of medical care. Right? The problem and the way that you attract medical care is you actually allow the free market to operate. The reason doctor, you're not getting more doctors is because it takes a very long time to become a doctor. I know. My wife's still going through it. Right? She's in residency right now. And it takes an awful lot of money. You have to invest in being a doctor. No one's going to invest you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in becoming a doctor if they're going to get paid sixty grand on the other end. It doesn't work that way. It's why every doctor right now is trying to go into what they call the road, which is, which is radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesiology, dermatology. Right, because those are all private, and because insurance doesn't cover a lot of those, it's all cash. So, so a lot of doctors are going into these things because the market works. So what you actually need is to remove a lot of regulations on health insurance, a lot of regulations on doctors, and make it easier for people to actually go into the business of doctoring. I mean, some of the licensing requirements in order to diagnose a cold are silly. Like now that this is one thing that they're actually doing that's good. Nurse practitioners, if you go in and you want to get a diagnosis for a flu, you can have a nurse practitioner do it. That's good. Right? I mean, why should a doctor have to diagnose me with a cold? I can diagnose my daughter with a cold, right? Uh, but it's, but um, the only way that, that you fix a supply and demand problem, just as far as supply and demand curve goes, is not to raise the demand. Obama just raised the demand without raising the supply. And so what's happening is that rationing is taking place, essentially. And so what you actually need to happen here is you need to remove a lot of the regulations. Best example possible is laser eye surgery. Laser eye surgery is entirely private, right? Nobody funds laser eye surgery. Insurance doesn't cover it. It's an optional surgery. 
Very few insurance companies cover laser eye surgery. It's almost entirely done on the basis of you walk in and you pay. When laser eye surgery started, each eye was $20,000. Today you can get laser eye surgery for under three grand in most places. Why? Because every doctor who wanted to make money went into laser eye surgery, and they have 20 different options for laser eye surgery. The quality is better, and the care is better, and the cost is better. That's what happens in a free market. In a publicly regulated market, you end up with worse care, higher cost, and less of it. So you actually need to remove a lot of the regulations. And I, I hope that's what Trump does, although from what he's talking about, I don't see that happening. I mean, Trump, Trump just said this week that he wants to maintain the centerpiece of Obamacare, which is forcing insurance companies to cover people with pre-existing conditions. That's not insurance. Okay, take fire insurance. Nobody is, after you burn down your house, you can't go and buy fire insurance. After I'm sick, I can't go buy health insurance. That's not insurance anymore, now it's health care. What people should really be doing is buying catastrophic health care, right? Catastrophic health insurance, rather. You should be buying stuff for like, you break your leg, you have hospital costs, you have cancer, you have hospital costs. Right? It shouldn't be that every time you go to the doctor for any sort of care, like a cold, you have a $25 copay. You should just be able to pay your doctor cash for that. It's a silly thing. You're there for five minutes and you leave. All of that only happens in a freer market, not in a more restricted one. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think conservatives are at an inherent uh, disadvantage mm -hmm. because um, the arguments we make are primarily logical and there's not a, an emotional component to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part, one of the other question askers talked about um, the millennial map. And I yes. think that's a big part, as Dennis Prager puts, the age of feelings. It's so easy to make the argument you know, for same-sex marriage and say, yeah, love should conquer all. Like You can say that in a phrase. Right. Whereas the conservative argument, you have to whip out a 200-page book to, right. to you know, talk it through. Mm -hmm. So is it worth, for average people who don't have all this background of, of um, conservative ideas and all these persuasive things they can say, is it worth it to argue on an emotional level? Yes. Is it possible to do it as a conservative, or, or yeah. should we do it the more logical it is. way? No, no, you, you, should, you have to argue on the emotional level to get them out of the realm of emotion, then you can have a logical discussion. Right? This is why I say that what the left wants to do is assume moral superiority. When they say all love should be rewarded and stuff like that, Right, then they're not arguing on a, on a, even a feelings level, they're arguing that it's a moral argument. Right? They're, they're arguing you're immoral because you don't agree with me here. Right? Love, Trump's hate, and all this kind of stuff. So the only way to come back with that is with a moral argument. Right? You say something like, do you believe that, it, why would you want to deprive a child of the experience of having a mother and a father? Right? Because that's really what marriage is about. And marriage isn't just about two people who love each other. I don't care who has sex with one another. I really don't. You know, what I care about is, is the children. That's what marriage was about. Marriage was an institution that was designed for the child, for the bearing and rearing of children. And that's why the state originally got involved. Now my belief is that the state should get completely out of the business of marriage entirely because the state sucks at everything. They haven't been able to forward the institution of marriage and now gay marriage is gonna be used as a cudgel to beat religious people over the head, right? They're gonna say, the state says gay marriage is okay. Why won't your church perform a gay marriage? We're taking away your tax exemption, right? That's where this is going next. But the truth is that, that marriage was always a religious institution, mostly. And this argument would fall away if you took it out of the realm of government almost immediately. It really would, because, again, what the left wants is for the government to play God and confer dignity. This was Anthony Kennedy's argument. Right? When you say the government is not capable of conferring dignity to me or to you, it can't confer dignity to anyone, right? then, it's, then that's, that's, a, that's a moral argument. That's a moral argument. It's more likely to have an impact. Like when I say to people about gay marriage that I want the government out of it, you know, and me personally, like I'm a religious person. That means that when I got married, I had two different birth, uh, I had two different uh, marriage certificates, right? I had the state marriage certificate, and then I had the Jewish one called the the the, the ketubah, and uh, and I only cared about the ketubah. I don't know where the the state one is. It's buried somewhere in our garage, I think. Um, but the, the ketubah hangs on our wall, and that's because that was an important document to me religiously. It meant that I was married before God, and meant I could have sex with my wife. The state one didn't mean anything to me, right? I was married by the state like three months before the before the religious one, and that was a hard three months. So I was married. By the <laughs> so I'm much more. So, so the the idea being that if the argument on the left is privacy, okay, so let's make this whole thing private. Maybe make some different arguments, and, and they should be moral arguments first. And then once you make the moral argument, put them on the defensive. Explain. You say a child doesn't need a mother and a father. Okay, which one don't they need? The mother or the father? Is it just arbitrary? You just make it up. Why doesn't, a, why doesn't a young boy deserve a father? Or alternatively, why doesn't a young boy... Do you, which one, you're, you were probably born into a family with a mother and a father. Which one of your parents would you discard? Right? Which one of them was less important to you? Which one do you think you'd probably just replace and it would be fine? The left doesn't have a lot of good answers to that because there's not a good answer to that.
I'd love to see you like package up those emotional arguments you can make so that. Yeah, I mean, you can make eight dollars a month and you can get it on the podcast. But yes. And, uh, <laughs> So my question is, um, like Donald Trump's rhetoric uh, has uh, always been very like absolute, like oh we're gonna deport all the immigrants, uh, <laughs> illegal immigrants. Yeah. we're gonna you know do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna repeal we Obamacare. We had no other choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question is, right, uh, as he's sort of gone back on a lot of that stuff, mm -hmm. yeah, like just what can you foresee with the Donald Trump presidency? I mean, no one can foresee anyone, anything. He's a, he's a uh, he's an inkblot. You know, what, what you see in him says more about you than it does about Trump. Because Trump has given a thousand different positions on every single issue. He's taken the Jeb Bush position on immigration. He's taken the Pat Buchanan position on immigration. He's taken the Ted Cruz position on immigration. He, he has more positions than the Kama Sutra. I mean, he's all over the place, right? And this is true on virtually every issue. The only one he hasn't shifted on is tariffs. He really likes tariffs for some odd reason. But you know, beyond that, he's really, he has, it depends on the audience, right? If he's speaking in front of a business audience, he talks about how it's evil and terrible that the government is quashing you. And then when he talks in front of a bunch of blue collar workers in Ohio, he says, look at these evil business people who are offshoring. We need to regulate those businesses more. Right? So he gives a bunch of different messages to the same people or to different people, and he's all over the place. So that's why really in the end, the argument for Trump came down to at least he's not Hillary, which is a pretty good argument, admittedly. Um, but what, what you see in him is largely dependent on what you want to see in him. So what I've tried to do is, look, I think that he's, I don't think Donald Trump is a good person. I don't think Donald Trump is a philosophical conservative. I'm trying to put my own biases aside and say, let's wait and see, because that's all we can do. Everything else is speculation, right? And if I had to speculate, then I would speculate that he does a couple of good things, and then he does a bunch of things that I don't like, because that was his campaign. So, but it, maybe he'll surprise me. I'm not in the speculation business anymore. This election has put me out of the speculation business. So I don't know what he's going to do. Um, but neither does anybody else. So anybody else, and this is, this is where I, I had some real quarrels with people like Ingram and Hannity in the primaries who kept saying he's the most conservative conservative that was ever conservative. That's a lie, it's not true. Okay, and they, and they knew it wasn't true and they kept saying it over and over because they were Trump backers. And that I object to. Just be, what, what you should demand of every commentator, not just me, is to be truthful. And when we make a mistake, to say we made a mistake. Right, and to, and to give you our best, our, our best facts that are available to us, not what we wish, not what we wish cast Trump to be. And so I'm not wish casting Trump. Maybe he'll be good, maybe he'll be bad. I don't know yet, right? And that's, that's all I can say about him. Uh, and one more question. My dad is a huge fan of you. Is it okay if I get a picture with you? Yeah, absolutely. We'll stick around. We'll do some pictures after that. Okay, I guess we're all done. Well, we can do, we can do like, why don't we do one? Will you want the last guy? Or did you already ask a question? Uh, I asked one. Already. Okay, so why don't we have somebody else who didn't ask one come on up? <laughs> All right, so after the election, uh, a lot of people who didn't agree with the uh, results with social media and tweeted the hashtag, uh, not my president. Yeah. Do you think that after the dust settles, this divide will kind of diminish, or do you think it's going to increase? Uh, I think that it's going to remain pretty bad. I, I didn't see the divide you know, decrease over the course of Obama's presidency. I don't expect it to decrease over the course of Trump's. Uh, and Trump is a much more bombastic figure than, than Obama is. Obama's a celebrity president. But Trump is, uh, is, a, is a very bombastic guy, so I can't imagine that he's not going to throw some, some bombs somewhere in here that actually stir the waters a little bit more. It is ironic that everybody was saying to Trump, are your followers going to accept the results of the election? And he, was, and he basically said, yeah, and nobody believed him. And, uh, and then Hillary loses, and her followers are tweeting, not my president. Right? Like Barack Obama was my president. It doesn't mean I liked him. Right? I have relatives I don't like either. But, he was, a, but, but he, he was my president. That's the way the system works. I wish he'd been a better president. He wasn't. And Trump, who I didn't vote for, again, is my, he's my president. I, I pray and I hope, just as I pray and I hope that every president does a good job for the American people. Uh, it's, it's bizarre of the left to play this game where he's not their president so long as, so long as they lose. Right? It's only, it only works if they win. That's why, for all the talk about the Electoral College, I think there are actually some pretty good arguments for getting rid of the Electoral College. There's some bad arguments, too. But I'm not going to listen to the arguments until the person making the argument is the person who won because of the Electoral College. Right? I'm not going to, like, when, when a person wins the popular vote and loses the Electoral College, and they were fine with the Electoral College until two minutes ago, then I'm, you know, then I have problems with their argument. So the, the whole illegitimate president, he's not legitimate, he's not my guy. First of all, it, it's sort of like when people say that it, it's, the, it's the, the, old, the old kind of 
uh, the old kind of routine when people say they don't believe in God, right? God doesn't care, right? God, the, 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 God believes in you, right, is the idea. Um, Trump doesn't care whether you think he's your president, okay? If you decide to try and treat him as though he's not your president and disobey the law, there will be consequences for that because it turns out you live in the United States. So they can, they can whine and, and scream as much as they want. I think they're looking really childish. And I think that all they're doing is driving more people into Trump's camp by looking this childish. Just like I think that you know, the, the protesters come protest me at, at these colleges. I think they're making more people uh, sympathetic to my positions by making themselves look foolish. Well, thanks so much. If you, want to, if, you want to, if you want to do a few pictures, why don't we do, we'll do it, you know, let's get a line going, uh, and then we'll have, uh, you know, one person take the pictures and they'll be handed the cameras.